So I've been trying to do a video about state machines for quite a long time now. And I think this is the right moment because state machines are starting to get some traction in the front end development, especially because of the work done by David K. Piano with the X state library. And it's funny because state machines are extremely popular in other software engineering areas, such as game development, embedded systems, and so on and so forth. So what is a state machine? To start, it's not a library. It's a concept that you can use in any programming language. As the name implies, it's something that contains a piece of state. But what's special about a state machine is that you cannot freely change the state. When you create the state machine, you already define all the possible states that that state machine can contain, as well as all, as well as all of the possible transitions between these states. It sounds weird, so let's jump straight to an example. Before jumping to the code, just a quick message. Uh, if you like my videos and you want to support my work, consider buying some fun merchandise like these fun React logos of sorts. All right, let's get to it. So I'm building a stopwatch. Uh, you can see it here, I can start, I can pause, and can start again, or I can reset. And here's the code. I have an use state to uh, control the time. I also have a ref to control the interval ID, which I get when I set interval. This is the start button. Uh, I display the time in a formatted way. It's just a simple formatting function that comes elsewhere. Uh, I have a pause button, which just clears the interval. And I have a reset button, which clears the interval and set the time back to zero. Of course, this is not using a state machine, and I already have some problems with this. The first one is that I want to conditionally hide or show the buttons depending on what the user is doing. So, for example, if the timer is already running, I don't want to show the start button. Additionally, this already contains a bug, because if I hit start again, it starts new timers. Uh, and I lose, the, content, I lose the, the interval ID from the previous one, so I now not only is running faster and faster, but I can't pause or reset. So let me refresh this and let's refactor this to use a state machine. So the first thing I'm going to do is npm install xstate and xstate react. I'm really not going to go deep into this library right now. I'm just going to show you how to structure a code and how a state machine can help. I plan to do a future video talking specifically about the many other features that xstate provides. But for now, I'm going to install that and start refactoring my code. So what xState provides is, it provides this use machine hook that I can use here. So const, it gives me a machine and a send to trigger a transition. I'm gonna talk in a second. And I create a machine by running the machine commanding command and passing a configuration object. Now, a state machine, as I mentioned, is made out of states and transitions, and that's all the configuration that I have to do. So I'm gonna say states, and I'm, I have to think about all of the possible states that my application could be possibly in. So my application could be idle, not doing anything, it could be running, or it could be paused. So these are my states. So I declare it like this. Now for each state, I can define the possible transitions. Where can it go from that specific state? So from the idle state, I can go only to the running state. And I get, uh, I get to give a name for this transition. So I'm gonna call this start, and this will go to running. From my running transition, the only thing where it can go it from paused, which goes, or I'm gonna call it pause, it goes to the paused state. And finally, from the paused state, I'll be able to reset everything. I'll call this transition reset, which will go back to idle. But I can also go unpause, go back to running, which I'll call it start again. Yes, I can give transitions the same name in different contexts. So yeah, this is my state machine. Now, what's really cool about state machines is that I can make all of this code that I'm running here 
as effects of enter or leaving I state. So for example, what I'm going to do is, every time I enter the idle state, this is called an entry callback, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to reset the state, so set time to zero, and if there is an interval, I'm going to clear it. So clear interval, I already have a ref here that I'm using to keep track of the internal uh, of the interval ID. Now, if I enter the running state, I'm just going to copy and paste this. I'll start an interval of 100 uh, milliseconds and I'll keep in, uh, incrementing the time. And when I enter the pause state, what I'm going to do is clearing the interval. So what I did is I thought about the possible states that my application could be in. I created the states, the transitions between them, and I created all possible side effects as consequences of, of entering and exiting the, uh, these states. Now I can completely clear my application from this uh, logic, and the only thing that my application UI is going to do is trigger state transitions, which I can do using this send method here. So if the user clicks the start button, I'm going to send I start transition. If the user clicks the pause button, I'm going to send a pause transition. And if the user clicks on the reset button, I'm going to send a reset transition. And what's really cool about this is that if the user tries to send a start transition, and I'm in the running state, I don't have a handle, I don't have a possible start transition here. So it's simply going to ignore. Let's try running this again. Uh, I need to start my application. Something wrong, oh yes, of course. On my state machine, I have to define what is the initial state. Yeah, it's only called initial. All right, so if I hit start, it starts. Notice that if I click start again, nothing happens. But from the running state, I can pause. If I click reset, nothing happens either, but I can pause. From the paused state, I can get back to start it, or I can reset. But now I can also hide these buttons as consequences of the state that I'm currently in. And for that, I'm going to use this machine here. So back in my UI, I can do something like this. I only show this button if the machine has a next event that includes start. So next events lists all of the possible transitions that go out from the current state. Show this. Okay, let's hide this. Let's create one. Or pause. Let's call this pause. And let's create one for reset. There we go. Now look at that. Look at my code. It's the render code is super clear, but now I have also conditional UI. Now I only got the start button. If I hit start, I only get the pause button. And if I pause, I get to restart or reset. Now, if it wasn't clear, one of the main benefits of using state machines is that it makes impossible states impossible. And that's a catchphrase that many <laughs> users of state machines use. And what it means is that we developers are really good at considering only the main, the happy paths, and not even thinking about uh, the edge cases. And state machines forces you to think of, of all the possible states in advance. It's, it forces you to model your possible states. And that already is a big benefit. And it also enforces that your application cannot switch to an, an unknown state. And this brings the question, 
Why isn't state machines used more in front end? I thought about that question for a long time, and I think that Christian Alfoni, which is the author of many JavaScript and React statement, manage state management libraries such as Overmind, I think he has a great answer for that. Is that front end development and graphical user interface development in general can get away with a lot, can hide a lot of crimes by hiding UI. Let me show you the clip. Originally, state machines, they were there because all the functionality was available to the user. So for example, take a Walkman, which is a typical state machine example. Like you have all the buttons always available, but you aren't supposed to be able to press them always. And that is why a state machine is really, really good because it can make the Walkman understand whatever button you press, are you supposed to be able to press it? Um, and you can imagine like in a, an aircraft or a freaking spaceship, you have all these buttons always available to you, but you are not allowed to, to press them at any point in time. But here's the thing, hiding UI is fragile uh, because if you have to implement a new feature or if many different people are, are working on the software at the same time, this is the kind of solution that will certainly lead to an, to an edge case and to a bug in production. So what are some good use cases for state machines? Well, every time you have complex conditional UI, as I showed you, or handling of asynchronous code, like network requests with retry and cancellation logic, uh, these are great cases for using state machines. In fact, every time you find yourself with multiple booleans, like is downloaded, is fetched, uh, is error, is loaded, is retry, those are probably a terrible idea and it's a good candidate for using a state machines. So, as I mentioned, I didn't cover like 10% of what the X states library can do. And also, uh, you can create state machines without using a library. So I plan to do a new video uh, where I'm going to cover creating state machines in plain JavaScript for usage with React and also covering the other features that X state provides, such as hierarchical state machines, parallel state machines, running state machines from state machines with the actor model and state charts, which are not the drawings of the state. Well, it does that too. State chart is an evolution of state machines that can contain both finite number of states and infinite number of states. It's really crazy. And see you on the next videos. If you don't want to lose, make sure you subscribe. Bye bye.